Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for this Safety and Health Magazine webcast. We're going to give our audience about two minutes to get settled in and join us today. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Once again, we thank you all for joining us today for the Safety and Health Magazine webcast. We're gonna give our audience just one other minute to settle in and we'll start the presentation in about 60 seconds. Thank you. Hi, hello, and welcome to everyone out there in the audience today to our Safety and Health Magazine webcast, Housekeeping Tips for Your Safety Program, sponsored by KPA. My name is Barry Botino, and I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine. Thanks very much for joining us. On behalf of the National Safety Council, we would like to send out a special thank you to all the safety professionals who are working very hard every day to keep their colleagues safe and healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic. In just a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I'd like to go over some webinar housekeeping items. The views of today's speaker and organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session with our speaker. To ask a question, just click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and press the send button. You can ask your question at any time at all during the presentation. You do not have to wait for the Q&A to begin. We will try to answer as many questions as possible today, but we might not get to every question. The good news is, is any questions we don't get to, will be forwarded along to our speaker. At the end of this webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, but I'll tell you about that a little later. This webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, you can visit our website at safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's introduce our presenter, our speaker today is Jonathan Wells, who serves as a risk management consultant with KPA. Jonathan has more than a decade of experience in the environmental health and safety field. In his work with KPA, Jonathan performs EHS inspections, writes safety plans, and conducts trainings with clients to help them reduce injuries and loss. Again, we thank you all for tuning into this presentation. And to start things off, I'm gonna hand it off to Jonathan's colleague, Emily Hartman, to get us started today. Thank you for joining us for today's KPA webinar. We'll get started shortly. First, I'd like to provide a quick introduction of KPA. With over 30 years of expertise, KPA provides environmental health and safety and HR management solutions through our software and expert consulting services. KPA helps clients identify, remedy, and prevent safety and compliance issues to prevent accidents and injuries, reduce lawsuits, fines, and penalties, improve productivity, and protect your reputation. KPA solutions help organizations maintain a culture of safety, lower risk for your employees and your businesses, and reduce costs. 
Learn more at kpa.io. So my name is Johnson Wells. I'm a risk management consultant with uh, KPA. I've got 10 years of environmental health and safety experience. Um, I see clients in Arkansas, Louisiana, Missouri, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in environmental soil and water science and I have a master's in occupational environmental health. Okay, so today we're going to go over the five S principles. Let's be sort, set in order, shine, standardize, sustain. You guys might have heard about that. Um, we'll go into more detail about what that is, how you can use it, how to get everybody motivated to do it, um, how to uh, how clean work environments go hand in hand with safety. We'll go over all these different things. Um, I know cleaning isn't something most people like to do, and it's hard to self-motivate to pick up and organize. Most of the time when I mention housekeeping to one of my clients, I get some eye rolls, but it actually is really important really help your facility in a lot of ways. My goal today is to show you several ways it can help your business, give you some strategies like I've already talked about to make it as painless as possible and to get your employees motivated. So importance of good housekeeping. First off, um, less clutter uh, equals less stress. Uh, Princeton researchers have found that clutter causes you to be more distracted and affects your focus. So by cleaning up your messy workplace, it's, it, uh, it'll clear up your vision help you focus more, take them to town to clean up your workplace, may also help you relax and have a, chance, a change of pace from your regular schedule. So it is a nice break, if, if nothing else, just to uh, get away from whatever you're doing for a minute, kind of spruce up your area, all that kind of stuff. It'll make you feel better, make you feel like you're accomplishing something. Um, I was just talking to my wife yesterday about, about doing some paperwork in our living room where the kids are screaming, the TV's on, music playing, all that kind of stuff. And instead of working on the paperwork, and playing with kids and watching TV. You're kind of only halfway or even not even halfway doing all three things. You're not really focused on any one thing. So when there's a lot of stuff that's going on around you, you have a lot of clutter, you have a lot of distractions, you're not near as focused on uh, the one thing as you should be. Tasks take a lot more time than, than they should. They're a, lot less, they're a lot more likely to make mistakes. I know when my work area is clean and organized, I feel like my head is clear, just feel better overall. So less clutter, less stress, feel better. Second thing, uh, also a clean work area keeps the doctor away. When your desk is left uncleaned or any work area that you're working in, if it's not clean, you'll have dust bunnies, food debris, coffee stains, and the list goes on. So the germs and bacteria gather around you as you work, uh, or yeah, as you work may affect your health and cleanliness. Probably going to be more likely to have a stuffy nose, other issues, especially this time of year with all the pollen. Last week, wind was blowing through the woods at, uh, by my house. The pollen was so thick, it looked like it was smoke coming through the trees. Not realistic for me to think that that's also not coming inside our home, uh, coming you know into our work areas, all that kind of stuff. And if we don't get that area cleaned up, we're going to have sick employees. We ourselves might be sick. You might be hoarse, stuff you know, like I am at the second. But that's the second reason why. Third reason, keeping your work area organized helps you find things faster and it makes you more uh, efficient, uh, makes you more effective. You can do this by color coding your files or sorting paperwork based on the urgency of each task. It's also the same if you have files on your computer. Nothing I hate more than not being able to find something I need. It's frustrating. It's stressful. Um nightmares about not being able to find something when I'm looking for it. As long as it put me in a, in a bad mood, it takes a lot of time that I could be spending on doing some work, being productive when I'm looking for something that I really should be able to find pretty easily if I had organized it and put it someplace uh, easy to find. The fourth, lastly, keeping an organized workplace gives your coworkers and potential clients a positive image of your lifestyle and how you conduct yourself professionally. If the shoe was on the other foot, and you were going into a business and they had stuff scattered everywhere. It was dusty, lights were out, stains everywhere, everywhere the floor sticky, all that. Uh, would you think about, what would you think about the quality of, of their work? You probably wouldn't think that they put a lot of effort into their work. You might think they're a little bit lazy, they're cutting corners, they're not spending time on things that they should, all that kind of stuff. So it gives a bad image. But um, another reason housekeeping is so important is that it's an OSHA requirement. So even if the, the four things that I just mentioned, those kind of overview things, if that doesn't get your attention and you don't maybe care about those things, um, hopefully you'll care about uh, this. 
And although there isn't a straightforward regulation about good housekeeping, there is a general duty clause which says that an employer shall furnish to each of his employees uh, employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to his employees. Um, that is kind of a catch-all for everything. Um, we uh, the general duty clause it will a lot of times when something doesn't have a specific regulation this will uh, kind of cover all of it. Pretty much says that you as an employer uh, you have to do everything you can to make sure your employees have a work environment that will help prevent injuries. So and we'll get into how housekeeping will affect that here in a second. And we also talked about first impressions on the last slide before working for KPA. I was a state inspector. And I can speak for myself and any of my coworkers at the time, but I think any inspector is going to follow their first impression and try to prove themselves right. So um, if you walked into a place and saw a huge cluttered mess, you know, I was going to be looking super hard because my impression was that they didn't care about the facility and probably had a lot of violations. But if the facility was really clean and organized, I was less likely to do that. So another reason why housekeeping is so good, uh, so important. Um, one, it's going to prevent injuries, accidents, uh, or, or it has the potential to do that, and we'll get into that more here in a second. Um, but um, it does make it, if you do ever have an inspection or anything like that, it uh, gives that good first impression. So the 5S process. So hopefully now we can see that some of the reasons the housekeeping is important, but how do we do it? Where do we start? And probably the most used process to improve housekeeping and get the benefits that we've talked about so far is the 5S process. So those five S's, each S represents one part of the five-step process that can improve the overall function of the business. Process starts with sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and finishes with sustain. Uh, 5S process began as part of the Toyota production system. It's the uh, manufacturing method begun by leaders at the Toyota uh, Motor Company in early to mid 20th century. The system often referred to as lean manufacturing in the West aims to increase the value of products or services for customers. This is often accomplished by finding and eliminating waste from production processes. Over time, the 5S methodology leads to many benefits, including reduced cost, higher quality, increased productivity, greater employee satisfaction, and a safer work environment. So that, five, uh, that first S, sort, um, involves going through all the tools, furniture, materials, equipment, et cetera, in a work area to make sure what needs to be present and what can be removed. Some questions to ask during this, pro during this phase include, what is the purpose of this item? Do we even need it? Is it do, was it something that we needed at one point, but we don't need anymore, but yet it's still out here in our work area, taking up space, uh, being a potential trip hazard, all that kind of stuff. When was this item last used? Do we, like I said, do we even use it anymore? Do we even do the process that requires this item anymore? Is it obsolete? Do we have something better now? It's an old tool. How frequently is it used? If we don't use it very often, can we put away or stored somewhere else? So we don't really even have to have it handy if we don't use it that often. It can be stored, you know, in some closet away or some maybe even offsite if we rarely even use this piece of equipment. Who uses it? If only one person uses it, do we need multiples of the same item or tool? Does it need to be stored where everyone can get to it or just where that one person can get to it? Does it really need to be here it is overall what this whole sort process is, is to ask that question. These questions help determine the value of each item. A workplace might be better off without unnecessary items or items used infrequently. And these items can, be, uh, can get in the way, take up space, be a hazard, Keep in mind the best people to assess the items in a space are the people who work in that space. They're the ones who can answer these uh, questions uh, most uh, accurately. And I see a lot of places that have a tool like a grinder for every employee. Someone last week was telling me that when one of their employees left, they had to haul off two truckloads of all the stuff that this guy had collected, all these different tools and all that. There's no reason that someone needs that much in their work area. There are probably a lot of things we could share instead of everyone having their own taking up space. That same manager also took a bunch of scrap metal that person had in their workspace and got a couple hundred dollars uh, from all that scrap metal. So there's always that possibility too, but we'll get into more of the financial benefits in a little bit. Um, when a group has determined that some items aren't necessary, we can consider the following options. We can give items to a different department. 
We can recycle or throw away or sell the item, as that guy did. Uh, we can put items in storage for cases when an item's value is uncertain. For example, a tool hasn't been used recently, but someone thinks it might be needed in the future. Use the red tag method. Red tags are usually cardboard tags or stickers that can be attached to items in question. You just fill out information about each item, such as its location, the description, name of the person applying the tag, the date of the application. Then the item is placed in a red tag area with other questionable items. If after a designated amount of time, you know, maybe a month or two, the item has, if it hasn't been used, it's time to take that out of the workplace. We're not using that. Um, it's not worth hanging on to things that never get used since they just take up space. I know kids' toys, exact same thing. If it's something that it never gets played with, it's just taking up space, clutter, all that kind of stuff, we can take that away, sell it, give it to somebody else, whatever we're going to do with it. Um, it's always good, too, just for that red tag, because what, what could happen is we could red tag something and then completely forget that we did that, and then it just sits there for six months, a year, two years, whatever. So also setting a reminder on your phone, computer, something like that to remind you to go back to that item and make sure to see if it's been used or not, uh, that is helpful too. The second thing is to set an order. So once the extra clutter is gone, it's easier to see, you know, what's what. Now work groups can come up with their own strategies for sorting through the remaining items. Some things to consider, which people or, or workstations use which items. When are items used, maybe it's seasonal. So we it can be stored out of uh, you know out of the way most of the year. We only use that that tool, this whatever we're using. The same it's taking up space. We're only using it a, a small part of the year, so maybe it's a weed eater, you know, something like you, that. You're not using all year long, so we don't have to have that out around us all the time. Um, what uh, which items are used most frequently? It's not used often. It can be stored somewhere else. Uh, should item be grouped by type? a lot easier to find things if that was the case. So if we've got a bunch of items, we're storing them together, but all the items that we need for this process or this job or whatever, it's all together, it's going to be easier to find what we're looking for. Um, but where would it be most logical to place these items? Would some placements be more ergonomic for workers uh, uh, than others? Would some placements cut down on unnecessary motion? Uh, are more storage containers necessary to keep things organized? During this phase, everyone should determine what arrangements are most logical. That will require thinking about tasks, the frequency of those tasks, the past people uh, take through the, the space, et cetera. Businesses may want to stop and think about the relationship between organization and larger lean efforts, what arrangement will cause the least amount of waste. In lean manufacturing, waste can take the form of defects, or mistakes, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later, waiting time, employees sitting around doing nothing but still getting paid because we're whatever we're trying to do uh, we don't have the right tool for it or whatever it is so we've got to wait for that to come in or we've got to wait for somebody to go find something or whatever extra motion that's time lost because we're taking longer to do something or maybe walking back and forth between areas to do a job uh, things aren't organized properly so every, we're just having to move from one spot to another much more than we should have to excess inventory Stuff we uh, would bought that we don't need, stuff that we could sell, things that we thought we needed but we don't because we've already got it, but we didn't have it organized, so we didn't know we had it, all kinds of stuff. There's overproduction, there's extra process, there's unnecessary transportation, there's um, just unutilized talents. There's all kinds of ways that if we don't have things set in order that we're, we've got waste, um, we're not being lean. Uh, for uh, just a tip for this, for the purposes of 5S, specifically consider how the layout and organization of an area could increase, decrease that wait time, that motion, unnecessary transportation. And when I was in college, I had a summer internship at a uh, chicken processing plant, and they were implementing some 5S processes. And my manager at the time saw that at break time, people would have to walk all the way across the facility to take off their equipment, uh, you know, the, the covers, all that kind of stuff. Then they'd walk all the way back across uh, to another part of the facility to, uh, to clock in, clock out, all that kind of stuff, take the break. And it may not seem like that would save a lot of time, but even if it's taking an extra 30 seconds to, to get across the facility, facility, that adds up to a minute before the break and a minute after the break, times maybe three breaks a day. Maybe 100 employees are doing that, maybe over three shifts. 
you know, around 365 days a year. Well, that amounts to 11,000 man hours that, uh, for that one little thing, moving that equipment closer to the break room so we're not having to walk back and forth across the facility. Then you can do the math on whatever you're paying those employees, how much money that's going to save. Just the smallest little details really do add up. Next, Sean, <clears throat> everyone thinks they know what housekeeping is, but it's one of the easiest things to overlook, especially when work gets busy. It really quickly gets pushed to the back burner. It, um, we don't consider that housekeeping is making us money, uh, and that's what we're in the business of doing. Uh, so we, it's, not, uh, it's not one of the main things that we're thinking about, but we'll get into a little bit later how it actually can save and make money. But the, the shine stage of 5S focuses on cleaning up the work area, which means sweeping, mopping, dusting, wiping down services, putting tools and materials away, all those kind of things. In addition to basic cleaning, shine also involves performing regular maintenance on equipment, machinery, planning for maintenance ahead of time. It means businesses can catch problems and prevent breakdowns. That means less waste of time, no loss of profits related to work stoppages, having equipment last longer, Catching issues before they become major issues saves a lot of time and money. Uh, shining the workplace might not sound exciting, but it's important, and it shouldn't just be left up to the janitorial staff. It's everybody's job to clean up their own area. In 5S, everyone takes responsibility for cleaning up their workspace, ideally on a daily basis, probably at the end of the shift. Doing so makes people take ownership of their space, which in the long run means people will be more invested in their work and in the business. For any managers on the call, how much better is it when the employee takes pride in their work or their work area? It makes a huge difference. Um, given that when they take pride in it, they'll go that little extra mile to make sure things are done properly. And that, that is a huge difference. A tip on shine, how to clean may seem obvious, but make sure people know how to properly shine their spaces. Show employees, especially new employees, which cleaners to use, where cleaners uh, are stored, uh, how to uh, clean the equipment, especially if it's you know if it's a special delicate tool or a uh, piece of electronics or any of that kind of stuff. Make sure if you're giving somebody that responsibility to clean that, that they know how to do that. The next um, S is standardize. Once the first three steps of 5S are completed, things should look pretty good. All the extra stuff is gone. Everything's organized. Spaces are cleaned and equipment is in good working order. Problem is. When 5S is new at a company, it's easy to clean, get organized, and then over time, still let things slide back to the way that they were. Standardized makes 5S different from the typical spring cleaning project. Standardized systematizes everything that just happened and turns one-time efforts into habits. So standardized assigns regular tasks, creates schedules, posts instructions, so those activities uh, become routine. It makes standard operating procedures for 5S so that uh, orderliness doesn't fall by the wayside. Makes it clear to employees what's needed, expected, and how to do it. Maybe even more important than that, it lets people know who is responsible for what. Depending on the workplace, um, a daily 5S checklist or a chart might be useful. A posted schedule indicating how frequently certain cleaning tasks must occur, who's responsible for them, those are all helpful. Initially, people will probably need reminders about 5S you know, it, just like anything else, you give them a task. If it's not something that they're used to doing, you're probably going to need to remind them. Having these up, uh, these these uh, kind of, I don't want to say job sheets, but that's kind of what it is. If you have something like that up, it's going to help remind everybody what they're supposed to do. It helps them remember that they need to set aside that little bit of time every day to do that. But over time, tasks will become routine. Five S organizing and cleaning will become a part of the regular work. Um, just a tip, visual clues, signs. Labels, posters, floor marking tape, tool organizers, all those important role in 5S, those visual reminders that we need to be taking care of this, we need to be doing these, uh, this housekeeping, this 5S process. We can provide directions to keep items in place. In many cases, without words, just like I said, that visual reminder. If you've ever been in a 5S facility, besides the overall organization, the floor tape is a dead giveaway uh, that that is a, a facility that's using this process. It really helps remind people when things go or where things go. And if something is out of place, it really sticks out like a sore thumb when you've got uh, uh, the floor tape like that. Sustain, the last uh, S of the five S's. Once standard procedures for five S are in place, businesses must perform the ongoing work of maintaining those procedures and updating them as necessary. 
sustain refers to the process of keeping 5S running smoothly, but also keeping everyone in the organization involved. Managers need to participate, as do employees on the manufacturing floor, warehouse, and office, everybody. Sustain is about making 5S a long-term program, not just an event, short-term, short-term project. Ideally, 5S becomes a part of an organization's culture. And when 5S is sustained over time, that's when businesses will start to notice continuous positive results. So a couple of things to help sustain 5S practices, make sure all new employees, or even if it's not a, a new employee to the organization, it could be just a new employee to that department uh, or, or working in a different part of that department, that they know what they're supposed to do for that 5S. Again, if, if now they're taking care of this piece of equipment, make sure they know how to clean that piece of equipment. Uh, if they're running regular maintenance on something, tell them what to look out for to make sure that that is being taken care of properly. But keep things interesting. Uh, look at what other companies are doing with 5S. New ideas or organi- uh, on organization can help things uh, imp- keep things improving, keep employees engaged. Um, you know, when we first bring this up, you might get people's attention. You might get them to uh, get on board with it right away. But there's that little bit of time between when it's new and when it becomes a routine that you're most likely to lose people. And that's when they're going to get burnt out on it. They've done it once. They don't want to keep having to do it. That's when we really got to get creative on how to keep people motivated. And we'll get into some of that here in a second. So how do you get your team motivated? Um, it's a, Unfortunately, it's a lot like asking, what's the best way to tell my kids to pick up the rooms? It, it, there's no good way to do that. No, They're, they're not going to get super excited about it. Because a typical 5S prog- program involves a lot of cleaning and organizing. And like I've already said, that's not something that people want, most people, uh, get excited about. And although you can't change the fact that your locations may not stand up and cheer when initially hear that they're involved in a 5S implementation, you can make the prospect considerably more palatable by, one, positive, positively promoting it. Whether it's before and after pictures or testimonials from users who have already completed a 5S project, there's plenty of compelling evidence about how effective this discipline can be. At first, you may have to draw all these examples from the Internet, companies who pro- whose programs you're emulating, but as your own 5S gains traction, it could just as easily come from the early adopters within your company. So if somebody that works in your company is is really taking on this new housekeeping program and they're, uh, they can really see the difference, they can talk about how much easier it is to find the things they're looking for, how much less time it's taking to do things, use that as an example to really positively promote what you're trying to do. Second thing, we can provide an example. Um, that's kind of what we just talked about, but you want your facility managers um, to do maybe their offices first. Those who are uh, a little bit higher up, maybe held a little bit different different standard, we want them to go first. We, we want the managers to be involved, to show that they're serious about it, and then their employees that are under them will uh, will probably start to, to emulate what they're seeing. It's a small but powerful step. Uh, to give your location's uh, personnel a vivid example of how 5S truly works and demonstrate that your managers are fully on board for this initiative. Uh, and it, it does so much more than just sending out some memo or giving some you know, speech to everybody about how important it is. If they can see that you're taking it seriously and that all the managers are, it goes a, much, it goes a lot further. A uh, few, if any, operations have the kind of flexibility that will permit them to completely clear their schedules and focus on all their energy or focus all their energies on becoming 5s uh, com- uh, complete i guess instead most will have to figure out how to get it done while still capably fulfilling their day-to-day job responsibilities like i said earlier we're just gonna have to find those little parts of time in the day as, where we can clean as we go we can uh because uh, nobody's gonna have you know an hour at the end of the day to go through and clean up their workspace and stuff like that. So we need to find those times that we do. So we need to give people enough time. Um, choose a beginning and end date for your 5S implementation that's close enough to place it high on people's agendas, but far enough away to accommodate their varied workloads and busy schedules. So we don't want to say, hey, we're going to do this, but we're starting in six months. But we also don't want to say, hey, we're going to start this tomorrow. You've got three years to finish it because that, that's not going to work. Um, so maybe doing something like, hey, we're going to start it Next week, three months from now, we want everybody to, to be done with uh, at least that, that process of getting things to that 
that uh, fourth S where everything looks good now, now it's just maintained. But we do want to give advance notice. As soon as you know your 5S implementation is going to be a go, let your operations know that it's going to happen, even if the kickoff date is several months away. Still want to let them know that what's going to be coming so they can get it in their mind that they need to start preparing for what's coming. And again, it's not, it's not a huge undertaking, but everybody's busy, and then to tell them that you're throwing something on top of them may not be well received, but if you give them enough time to adjust, you'll be more successful. Supplying guidelines, not deadlines. Uh, it's perfectly okay to provide your operations with recommendations about how long each step should take, Something like one week apiece for sorting, setting an order, shining, but resist the urge to micromanage operations beyond that point. Trust your operations personnel to make the call about when they get things done. So we're going to give them kind of guidelines, but not say it has to be done by this point. Uh, again, that'll be more easily received if, uh, if we're helping people along instead of just telling them it has to be done. So how can companies best support their operations, 5S efforts? Support to do everything you can to equip locations with all the tools they need to succeed. And that means being practical as well as cerebral. In addition to making sure they're given clear and comprehensive 5S training and reference materials, uh, this might entail providing a starter kit. Much of 5S is very non-nonsense and hands-on, which is why it's advisable to ensure that locations have tangible items like label makers, marking tape, paint in hand as soon as uh, implementation, implementation begins. That way, they won't have to sweat the details of tracking those kinds of things down. Do I have to go to the store and get that? Is somebody going to provide that for me? You don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff. You just give it to them, say, here's what we need, here's what you need to do it, and then you've got, we're going to shoot for having a week to get this done. Again, they're much more likely to, to get on board with something if you're providing them everything they need. For, and because there's going to be so much stuff that maybe somebody's going to be getting, needing to get rid of, don't make them uh, anxious about what they're supposed to do with all that, those things they're getting rid of. Designating a formal support the sort effort that would be a great idea. It's much easier for operations to part with unused or unwanted equipment, supplies, and other long hoarded materials if they know those things might be used elsewhere, or if they don't, uh, have to work too hard to dispose of them. Uh, you may want to create a type of outline, or excuse me, online yard sale, uh, supplying the local contact information for various charities that might be willing to pick things up. Making standardization decisions at the corporate level. That's the next thing. Uh, asking individual operations to come up with their own standardization plans is about as efficient as asking all your employees to design and use their own versions of your comp uh, company logo. We want everything to be the same across the board. We don't want to say, well, Monday, this person's going to do all of it. Tuesday, this person's going to do all of it. And then another group says, no, 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 every day this person's going to do this one job. We want uniform across the board. Everybody knows what's expected. Everybody can get in it together. Uh, we've got it at the top level down, uh, it's very clear what the uh, sustain uh, process is. Okay, but a lot of times, and this is important especially to KPA people, is the uh, that 6S. So sometimes companies add a 6S, which would be safety. Uh, some companies like to, to uh, add that, that 6 safety S, um, when it's included, the system is often called 6S. Makes sense. The safety step involves focusing on what can be done to eliminate risk and work processes by arranging things in certain ways. This might involve setting up workstations so they're more ergonomic. So we're not using the same muscles all day long. We're not in the same position, not a lot of repetitive motion. Um, that'll help uh, alleviate some of that ergonomic issue. Marking intersections. Making sure we're not going to run into each other with the forklifts and, and having pedestrians walking in the same areas um, that could run into each other. With signs and labeling the storage cabinet for cleaning chemicals so that people are aware of potential hazards. If the layout of the workplace or the tasks people form are dangerous, those dangers should be reduced as much as possible, which is what that general duty clause said, right? So that's what the success focuses on. So how does housekeeping affect safety? So not only can housekeeping lead to low pro productivity, bad impressions, poor morale, it can also lead to slip, strip and fall hazards. If we've got air hoses, extension cords, we've got parts laid out, we've got spills that aren't getting cleaned up, all kinds of things like that, it's just a matter of time before somebody's going to trip over something, 
they're going to slip in something or they're going to fall and they're going to hurt their backs, their hips, their knees. And they could be out of work for an extended period of time. Next, fire hazards. Uh, if we've got electrical issues, if we've got, um, you know, exposed wiring, if we've got poor chemical storage, you know, we've got flammable chemicals that aren't being stored in the flammable cabinet. If they're not labeled, so we don't even know what they are. If we've got excess combustible storage, we've got a ton of boxes. We've got uh, a bunch of trash, all that kind of stuff that could be combustible uh, that we're storing. That is also a fire hazard. Third thing, the aisle clearance. It makes it less likely that someone's going to knock things off shelves that fall onto people. We're going to have less forklift accidents if we've got clear aisles that people can easily move in and out of. I'm sure you guys have all seen those videos where somebody's taking a forklift down uh, an aisle way. They end up hitting a rack, and then the whole thing comes tumbling down. There's 500 or, or probably more on YouTube. I'm sure you've all seen them. But if we had more clearance, um, 28 inches for any normal pedestrian walkway is how much we need, 10 feet for if it's got a forklift going down it. So we got to make sure we've got clear paths. If we've got storage in those aisleways because we've got just so much extra stuff, you know, it, it's a good chance that somebody's going to hit something, somebody's going to hit somebody else, all that kind of stuff. Next to exit paths, we want to make it easy to get out of uh, the building in any event of emergency. So if we've got boxes or storage in front of the exits or blocking our paths out of highways or any of that kind of stuff, that could be an issue where somebody could get stuck inside the building or have to run way around, uh, uh, taking longer to, out of a, to get out of a building. The uh, next is blocking. Blocking fire extinguishers, eye washes, electrical panels, all those kind of things. It makes it harder to get to emergency equipment. Shut off those electrical panels if there is some sort of a uh, an electrical issue, if something's uh, malfunctioning, any of that kind of stuff. You need to be able to get to those electrical panels. If somebody gets something in their eyes, OSHA says you've got to have seven seconds uh, to get to that eye wash. Keep in mind that anybody that's needing to go to the eye wash probably can't see. So if we've got a bunch of stuff in their path, if we've got a bunch of electrical cords draped all across the floor in front of the eye wash, a good chance that person's going to trip going to the eye wash. And fire extinguishers, again, makes sense. If there's um, an emergency and somebody's running to try to get over to the fire extinguisher, but they've got a bunch of stuff stacked in front of them, we've got to move a bunch of stuff out of the way before we can get to the extinguisher, it could really easily be a problem. It could make things much worse uh, than had we'd been able to just to get to what we needed to quickly. Uh, next, that hazard communication. Kind of already talked about this with the fire and stuff, but if we make it clear what chemicals are, everything's labeled, everything's going in its place, everything's put away where, the, where it needs to be in the fire cabinet or whatever else, we're not going to have, you know, somebody get something corrosive on them. We're not going to have fire hazards because chemicals are being stored improperly, all kinds of stuff. Uh, we're not going to think one chemical is one thing, but it's actually something else because we didn't put it where it was supposed to be and we didn't have it labeled. There was a uh, car dealership. Their detail department, uh, they weren't labeling their squirt bottles. They weren't putting things where they were supposed to be. So somebody grabbed a squirt bottle that they thought was one thing, but it was actually something else, started spraying it in the back of a customer's car, and it bleached out all their seats. So things like that can definitely happen. So we want to make sure that everything is put in its place, everything's labeled, we know exactly what that hazard is, uh, what that chemical is, so that we can get it taken care of. And we catch issues early. So if we've got leaking equipment, if we've got tanks, we have hydraulic leaks, we have electrical issues, anything like that that could become a major issue. If we got everything put away, it's clean, we're doing that kind of um, maintenance uh, phase that we were talking about in the, in the uh, 5S stuff that we were talking about earlier, we're going to catch those issues before they become major, major problems. All right, so, so here are some real-world examples of poor housekeeping, things that we see a lot of. So what's the problem here? We've got trash that's spilling out of a trash can and a lot of times in the places that we go into you can see a lot worse than this um just like <laughs> you might have people in your own household that instead of taking the trash out if the deck can still stack it up and it doesn't fall over the trash doesn't have to go out yet well that's not really true and especially in the workplace if we need to get more trash cans because we're filling them up too often then we can get new more extra trash cans you know that's not that hard to do uh, if we need to designate that the person who takes out your trash does it more often, then we do that. But here's the problem is that we start to attract bugs. We start to attract rodents. Um, we get uh, stuff that might spill out of the trash can on the floor that somebody could slip on, all kinds of stuff. So we got to make sure that we're getting that taken care of properly. 
Another example. So what's the problem here? In the foreground, we have a bunch of cardboard boxes. Again, those are for more bug, uh, rat, mice, rodent problems. They could be sta staying in there. If we got a bunch of cardboard like this, that could be a, a combustible issue. So if we have a fire hazard, we could also have uh, be blocking aisleways, which is what it looks like in this picture. That it would be really hard to get anywhere back in there. But in the background, you can see some of those boxes that are st stacked up really tall back there, and it's really likely that those are going to fall. Um, any cardboard like that, if you live in a part of the country where it's it's humid, those boxes start falling apart real quick about this time of year. Uh, the integrity of them, the, the structure of them really start to fall uh, fall apart. So uh, those boxes start to fall down. They, uh, uh, if we're not stacking things up the right way, if we're not storing things the proper way, then there's a good chance that we're gonna have a, another issue there. So a lot of things in this picture. Next in this picture, what's the issue there? We got, uh, we got a fire extinguisher that we can't get to. Uh, you gotta have three feet of clearance around every fire extinguisher, which a lot of times that's hard to do because we have so much stuff. To have three feet of wall space that we're not for every extinguisher, and they have to have an extinguisher every 50 feet. There's a ton of wall space that we can't use because we've got fire extinguishers everywhere. And that's not even including exits and eye washes and electrical panels and all that kind of stuff. So we've got so much stuff, we're probably blocking a lot of these things that we don't need to block. Um, Less in this picture, if this guy was looking for a chemical, how easy would it be to find what he's looking for on this workbench? Uh, probably going to have to thumb through a bunch of stuff. It's going to take a lot of time. Good chance he's going to find – he might grab the wrong thing, which would be – uh, an issue that we've already talked about. A, a good chance that we're going to have to redo things because we didn't, we couldn't easily find what we were looking for the first time. We make mistakes that way. All right. Another one. What's the problem here? So we've got excess trash that's just laid out. Again, we're going to have a chance that we get spiders, that we get rodents. That uh, um, if it's a spot where we can keep uh, water, that just uh, uh, you know, in, in, on the sides of the bags, all that kind of stuff, we might get. Mosquitoes, all kinds of problems that could lead from this. We get bug bites, we get spider bites. I know one of my facilities, they had a state inspection because they had too many accidents, uh, and it really didn't take that many. It was just three, but two of those accidents were people getting spider bites. So had that not happened, they wouldn't have had their state inspection, fines, all that kind of stuff that come from it. Uh, and even if they don't get fines, just having to deal with somebody being in your facility, inspecting all of your stuff. We can avoid that. We can avoid those accidents where people might have to get on some workers' comp insurance or they might even have to lose time, any of that kind of stuff, if we can keep up these areas clean. Another one, we got all these hazardous chemicals. One, that's a problem because uh, we don't know what all that is. If there is something in that back of that uh, stack that's uh, starting to rust out, that's starting to corrode, any of that kind of stuff, we wouldn't know. We're not being able to check these chemicals. Also, if any of it, uh, there's a fire issue, we're probably not going to know because uh, I really doubt if you're storing your chemicals this way that you know where all the fire hazards are in, in that room. Also, it's a good chance that uh, some of that's going to fall. Um, and if you were looking for like maybe some of that paint, a specific kind of paint, this is that kind of stuff we were talking about earlier with that 5S process. Is you're going to have to take forever to just find what you're looking for. How much time are, and, and money are we losing and time are we wasting to try to find the things that we're looking for? If we had everything organized, everything properly laid out so that we knew exactly where it was, we could save a lot of time and energy on that too. Next, not every time that you see in your tiles that this, this water damage here, not every time is that mold, but sometimes it could be, um, which of course would affect indoor air quality. So if we catch these early on, if there is a leak in the roof and somebody says, hey, in my area, I was doing my uh, shine part of my uh, 5S process and I noticed that there is a, there's a leak in the roof and we can catch that before it becomes an issue. And it, before mold does grow, we can have that be an issue or have that be uh, taken care of. Um, next one problem here again, how in the world are you going to get to the stuff in the back of that uh, uh, mess? If uh, there is something in there that uh, is a corrosive hazard, fire hazard, any of that kind of stuff, we're probably not going to know. If uh, there's rodents living in there, it could be anything. So another example of bad housekeeping. Another one, um, you can see this aisleway here, uh, kind of in the background. There's a lot of stuff getting stacked in these aisles. 
and a forklift's going to have to go around this one of the foreground to the right, and then a little back to the left. And if we've got a forklift that's having to swerve in and out of all this kind of stuff, there's a good chance you're going to hit um, a rack or some product, or they're uh, not going to be paying attention to what as much as they could because they're having to watch all this stuff and end up hitting somebody or anything else. So there's another example there. Last one of these real world examples. Um, this one right here, we've got the first aid kit, the eye wash, and the fire extinguisher all blocked. So we got a triple threat right here. So we want to make sure that, uh, again, like we've already talked about, in case of an emergency, we easily can get to whatever we need to get to. If we need to shut something off, if we need to get somebody that eye wash, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, we don't have a bunch of stuff just stacked out that's blocking our path to all these uh, important things. It's not normally considered in the uh, five or six S process, but if there is a seventh S, it would be that dollar sign right there because I know that sometimes uh, starting a good housekeeping program is probably going to cost you, your company some money uh, to at least get it started implementing. Uh, that's why some organizations don't have a good program or maybe don't have anything at all. Unfortunately, a lot of companies don't see good housekeeping as necessary. They don't want to spend the money on it. And while it's true that it could cost companies a significant amount of money to successfully deploy a good housekeeping program, and change your company's culture, cost shouldn't be the only consideration. Companies contemplating the implementation of a new program are better served by asking, do, this, do the benefits of this outweigh the cost of it? And here are some of the potential benefits of a successful housekeeping program. Number one, we have increased revenue, decreased costs. So 5S or, or 6S helps reduce waste and helps pro processes run more smoothly. Organizations that employ it are able to sell, manufacture, and deliver more products and services of a higher quality quicker while using fewer resources. Number of mistakes are reduced, which decreases the number of, uh, or the need to redo number of mistakes, all that kind of stuff. Um, clutter, disorganization, and mistakes consume time, company resources without adding any value. So there's definitely one way that that uh, <clears throat> that uh, benefit outweighs the cost. Secondly. Increased customer satisfaction. The customer that gets a better product or service at a quicker time is more likely going to repeat be a repeat is more likely to be a repeat customer, and will also probably tell others about their experience. Just like I said earlier, that first impression when you walk into a place if it's nice and organized and clean, um, that really goes a long way. It would with me. I think it probably would with most people. Employee retention. Creating a clean and user-friendly work environment will also help create a happier employee. As we talked about earlier too, if we've got an employee that, that's being responsible for their work area, they'll take a little bit more pride in it. They'll be more invested in that. Not only will a happier employee be the better employee that are more likely to stay uh, at your company, that reduces the need to spend time and money looking for new employees, for hiring, for training, all that kind of stuff. So again, we're saving money there. Reduce cost of equipment uh, repair. Not regularly checking and maintaining equipment can lead to faster than normal wear and tear. If we were monitoring this stuff, if every day we were, uh, you know, cleaning our equipment and tools, all that kind of stuff, if we were watching out for any potential issues that when they're when they start off and they're minor before they become major, we're gonna we're gonna reduce the cost of that equipment repair. Uh, of course, that can hurt the bottom line if equipment has to be fixed or replaced and create a lot of downtime. It really adds up when you're having to pay employees uh, that aren't able to do the job that you're paying for. Reduced unnecessary spending. 5S or 6S program can help you better identify the resources you have available. So if we're going through and we don't have just a ton of stuff that we're having to sort through, we know what we have, we know what we need, we can reduce the spending if someone already has material, the tools, equipment, whatever that you need. Uh, we already know we have it. We don't have to go buy it again. Uh, prevention of costly injuries which is the one that probably us at KPA are most focused on. Not only can workers' comp insurance be expensive, you may be down an employee for an extended amount of time, and how might it affect company morale if everyone is having to work harder to cover for that person, if they're being reminded that injuries do happen at their work environment, if their buddy's out of work for a while, all those, all, it's all bad for company morale. Uh, and outside of that, we don't want anybody getting hurt, no matter if it's expensive or not. We don't want anybody getting hurt. But if somebody does get hurt, of course, that's expensive. And even if nobody does, if it's an OSHA issue, uh, maybe they come in with that general duty clause and say that you should have been providing a better workspace to avoid those injuries. OSHA fines 
uh, can be up to $13,260 per violation. So having a violation like that because we don't have a good uh, functioning work environment that, that uh, is helping prevent those injuries, that those fines can really add up too. So we want to make sure uh, that we're avoiding those as well. So maybe uh, if you don't want to implement a complete 5S or 6S program, you don't want to, um, maybe you, you're a small business and you don't want to have to do the whole, um, you know, setting up tape on the floor and all that. Maybe you don't want to do that. But if you don't want to, you can still save your company money, reduce injuries, overall just create a better environment for yourself and your employees by starting with a few simple steps. So here are a couple of examples of things that we can do uh, if you don't want to do the full 5S program. You can clean up after yourself. Make housekeeping a priority. Positively, re excuse me, positively recognize the employees that keep their work areas clean and encourage those that don't. Institute a routine cleaning schedule. Just like at your home or anywhere else, cleaning just once isn't going to last forever. So cleaning or creating a cleaning schedule can help make sure housekeeping becomes a routine. You may want to include safety equipment inspections in with your cleaning schedules. You have someone check your fire extinguishers, your eye washes, your tanks, all that kind of stuff. Have that be part of that cleaning schedule. Keep your flammables um, uh, and everything like that stored properly. Uh, to help reduce the potential for injury or loss, keep flammables stored in fire cabinets, sharps kept in sharp containers after they're used, et cetera, things like that. Keep tools and materials organized. Find a place for everything. You may, you may want to put tape on the floor to, make, to designate where things go. Uh, this will make it easier to find the things you're looking for. Like I said earlier, when, when you have everything that goes in a specific place, you really notice when things are out of place. Everybody's going to help put things back where they're supposed to be. You're going to keep your areas clear. You're going to keep, um, you're going to notice those issues early on. You're going to be more easily able to find what you're looking for. You're going to reduce the time it takes for you to do something because you're easily able to find it. Uh, you've got everything you need, all that kind of stuff. Um, so 5S really, 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 or 6S can really, really, really help your business in a ton of ways. And although, like I said, it, it can be expensive to get it started, uh, to give everybody all the equipment they need to, uh, to get everything going. It's hard to get people motivated, all that kind of stuff. But hopefully, we've gone over a couple of things that you guys can use. And I uh, hope, hope you see that it really can save you a lot of money too. And if nothing else, it really should help prevent those accidents. And if you do have an accident, uh, make it so that you guys can uh, avoid it from becoming a bigger issue. You know, not blocking eye washes, fire extinguishers, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, if you haven't had a chance to submit your question, go ahead and do so now. It looks like we did get a couple coming in as you were talking. Let's see, where did you find these seven second rules for the eye washes? I've always been under the impression of 10 seconds. Also, you've seen, uh, as you've seen, safety committees take a lot of time, uh, a lot of the duties of managing five us. So the seven seconds when I was working at the uh, facility that was uh, doing the uh, the five S program, they were saying uh, we did invite somebody in to do a safety inspection from the state. And he was the one that was telling us uh, seven seconds. And just like anything else, um, if you guys ever, if somebody tells you 10 seconds, but somebody from the state tells you seven seconds, uh, even if somebody in the state told you 10 seconds, you probably need to go with seven uh, just to be safer in that. Uh, you never know what inspector you're going to get. And from my experience, not every inspector is consistent. Uh, so we would go with seven on that. Now, with the stage committee meetings, getting them to get involved in the 5S process, that would be a great idea. Like I said at the start, getting your managers, who would normally be the people on your safety committee, um, to get them involved <clears throat> at the start really shows everybody else how serious you are about it. If you're telling them to do something, but your managers aren't doing it, probably not going to uh, take it as seriously. But also, your safety committee people are the people who are already a little bit more committed to this safety process. And if they're um, going to be out in the facility anyway, looking for fixing the issues, then they can be a little bit more in charge of the things that they're finding, uh, being a little bit more aware of what work areas need some extra help with this housekeeping um, but again, it's not any, any group's job. It's not any one person's job. It's everybody's. So to say, no, we're going to, we're going to have this five member team of our safety committee. They're going to be in charge of five S for the whole facility. 
I don't know how successful that's going to be because then we're not having the employees take their own ownership for it. So everybody does need to uh, be doing uh, involved and in, in doing their own things. Okay. I think um, let me check here. I think that was the only question I saw. Nope, one more. Uh, one extra one here. It says, I think it's worth mentioning, do not use brake clean or flammable. I already know where this is going. Flammable degrees here to clean the floors, especially in oil pits areas. So um, I don't know who asked this question, but there might be thinking of one specific incident that happened in Alabama. It's probably a little, maybe getting close to two years ago now, but uh, an oil pit area had some guys go down into the uh, oil pit to clean it get all the oil off the walls, the floors, the tanks, all that kind of stuff. And guys go down there and they're using brake cleaner, which probably works to get the oil off the floors, the walls, and all that kind of stuff. But if anybody knows anything about brake cleaner, very volatile. So when you're spraying it, it goes everywhere. Uh, the fumes do. But the problem is if you're down in a pit, it has nowhere to go. So um, all those fumes stayed right on top of all those people that were cleaning then one of the guys decides that he's going to light up a cigarette. And if you know anything else about brake cleaner, very, very flammable. So we had, I think it was three guys uh, down that, uh, that oil pit that died from the fire that that caused. Not, uh, not good in any way, not anything that uh, those people's families, not uh, that facility, not anybody uh, wanted any of that. So um, we got to be careful about the way that we're doing things too. Um, it doesn't seem like what would the hazard be of using this cleaner and all that kind of stuff, but there are different hazards. We got to make sure that the things that we're doing, the ways that, that we're deciding to clean up, the ways that we're deciding to organize things, that they are also safe. Um, on a much lesser scale, some people are allergic to certain chemicals. If you've got a cleaner that somebody's using and they're allergic to it, we need to know what we need to have all those MSDSs or SDSs for those chemicals that we're using so that we know what it is that we're being exposed to too. So it could be a ton of issues. So um, one person says to recommend Purple Power. Uh, another, uh, I guess, is that Purple Power the cleaner? I'm guessing. Um, all right. Well, I think that's it for the questions. I do appreciate everybody's time today. Uh, yes, that is a cleaner. So um, that is another chemical that uh, uh, is good for w w everything that we'd be doing. Uh, that wouldn't be as harmful and, and it's also uh, uh, successful at cleaning. So, um, but anyway, like I said, I do appreciate everybody's time today. Hopefully, uh, I was successful in my goal of teaching you guys about uh, a couple of housekeeping things and, and how it really can make a huge difference, save you money, all kinds of stuff. But I do appreciate your time, like I said. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for sharing your insights with us today for our webcast. At this time, we ask everyone to take a minute to fill out the evaluation survey. The survey will open in a different screen after this webinar. Your input is really important to us because it will help us to improve our future webcasts. I'd like to thank our outstanding presenter today, Jonathan Wells, everyone from our sponsor at KPA, and all of you who listened in today. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. Take care, everyone, and have a safe day.